by rigid transformation as close a relationship as you can, and then you sum all the squares of the of the distance, uh, all the yeah, squares of the distances, and th so this gives you the procrustis distance between the two shapes. Uh, Okay, so landmarks, they told us, was something they really would like to move away from, if they could. I mean, this is what they do. One reason is that landmark placement is tedious and time consuming, but in fact, it, it's uh, cleaning up these, these surfaces is at least as, as tedious and time consuming as doing the, the landmark placement, so I don't know. Uh, but in any case, it, it, the whole process is, is, is tedious enough that they typically will do for studies that they want to do only as many of the bones or teeth that they need in order to get a statistically significant number uh, so that they can publish the result or, or can be sure that they verify the hypothesis. Doug, as well as any, any paleontological collection in the world, have many, many, many more bones or teeth than they ever study. I mean, and they, their dream is if there were a method to actually automatically feed all these, these things and do, then they could do much more fine, 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 fine grained statistical studies. Um, fixed number of landmarks, well, that's kind of, of a lack of flexibility. I mean, sometimes things are very prominent on some of these teeth and, 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 and not so on other teeth. And so it would be great to not, to, to, to not have to have to place every landmark everywhere. Um, then it, it, it takes a graduate student in, in, in the field a couple of years to become reliable in placing these landmarks. And uh, so what it means is that even if you make your data, your scans of the surfaces available, and which, which Doug does actually for all of you who are interested in, in getting uh, uh, surfaces of, 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 of these, uh, getting scans of, of similar bones and so on, I saw uh, uh, Patrice uh, talked about uh, I mean, in, 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 in his talk. Uh, more for source is uh, uh, something that Doug Boyer uh, maintains and in which uh, he, and as well as other groups now, uploads uh, detailed scans of, 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 of bones and teeth. So if you'd like to work on bones and teeth, be my guest. I mean, uh, please, please let Doug know. He'll be happy. Um, and, well, in some cases, even experts don't agree on, uh, uh, on, 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 on placement of landmarks. So there's some degree of subjectivity. Uh, so the idea was, since, we, since we, we had these geometric methods, I mean, computational geometry, could we design a way in which we would uh, uh, get distances that were as good as these progressive distances for biological tasks. And uh, so, well, here you see the, uh, well, the R's in the other uh, direction, but uh, so that was the, the project we first started on, which was, how long ago was that, Yaron? Was that about seven years ago? Uh, yeah, seven years ago. Uh, and we, uh, we even agreed on, I mean, because how are we going to estimate that we had a method that did as well? And we had decided that uh, we would compare, uh, and you'll see later, uh, a diagram in which we, would, we were going to look at a whole number of samples. And uh, uh, so we would here have uh, the first surface as I, as J, and we were going to compare the matrices we would obtain by computing the distances we were going to propose and the distances they would compute. And the way I'll visualize that is that I'll give you uh, uh, the, the distance that is placed by an observer, a trained observer, a paleontologist, with the distance uh, uh, that we will propose. And uh, that was one thing. Uh, the other thing was that we would look at, 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 at certain teeth uh, and uh, we would uh, uh, look at, at how we would, we, so we would start from correct landmarks on, on, on one tooth. Uh, some of our methods lead to a mapping, so we would then look at uh, the other tooth and 
transform the landmarks to a mapping, and we would compare on this new tooth where they had placed the landmarks with our propagated landmarks. So we, we had, uh, and this is important to biologists, decided before we were going to do the study what our measures of success would be, and uh, we had to find them. And uh, what happened is that on the, so we had finely triangulated surfaces, typically, this is a lemur tooth. I mean, this is actually a mouse lemur tooth. So uh, this is an animal that's about this big. So you can imagine its second molar to be a tiny little thing. But uh, we, we, we look at them in big all the time. Um, so we defined two different distances. Oops, I, I seem to have the wrong slide here. So uh, we, uh, once, one distance, which is actually the one I was emotionally most attached to, but which we don't use anymore, was the conformal uh, Wasserstein neighborhood distance. So what we did is uh, we, we first, uh, we, we do this for, for, for in, in, in many cases, we uh, do a conformal flattening of the surfaces just because it's much easier to search on these 2D representations, of course, we have to make sure that we uh, stay conformally invariant since uh, that conformal flattening is only defined up to a conformal transformation of the disk, but that's a fairly small group. So, uh, uh, so we, make, uh, we do a conformal flattenings. Um, and we then, uh, the, the, the idea was to, to do a method that would, like what the biologists do, I mean, we, we questioned them to find out how they viewed what they were doing when they compared teeth. Um, on the one hand, they look at, at the local neighborhood of points to see how similar things are. On the other hand, they also look at how all this neighborly behavior relates to each other and integrates in the whole, uh, 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 the whole structure of, of the whole. So there's global and local things. And so what the idea was that we would uh, uh, first define a uh, distance. Well, I think the slide does it. Uh, uh, we would look at points Z and W on, on, on uh, arbitrary points. And we would try to find out how similar they were by looking at neighborhoods on this, uh, on the flattened, uh, 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 the flattened representation, we would look at the conformal factor which had, uh, uh, which carried some of the geometric information of the original surface. And in order to compare them, we would, uh, uh, in both cases, take, uh, well, we would, in fact, we would look at the neighborhood that was a, under a Mebius transform the image of a little disk around the center. On these disks, we would compare the relief of the, of the conformal factors. We would mod out for possible rotation so that the whole thing was conformally invariant. And then, so that gives us a similarity between points that we could define for all pairs of points. And then we would look at the uh, Kantorovich kind of, of minimum of, of the distance. Uh, the similarity we had defined that way. And because it looked at neighborhoods in a Wasserstein kind of framework, we called that the conformal Wasserstein neighborhood distance. So that was one distance that we had defined. Another distance, this turned out to be computationally also very intensive, too intensive. Uh, another one that we defined was the continuous procrustis distance. So the idea was, they, the, we, the, 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 the biologists had this procrustis distance based on landmarks. We didn't want to work with landmarks. But so what we could do is we could put down a whole lot of points on one surface, a whole lot of points on the other surface, and uh, try to, to, uh, uh, to, to we, we would put them fairly well distributed. Let's, put, let's say we put 100 points down kind of uniformly on one surface and uniformly on the other surface. Both surfaces, we always assume that they're normalized to, to complete area one. So, uh, because we don't want something at scale invariant. Um, and then we would try to find the best possible correspondence of these points. We also wanted to define that, to get a, 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 a something that we would define mathematically on the smooth surface and uh, by analogy of this, this saying, if you have 100 points fairly well distributed, 
then you could say the sum of the squares of the distances are kind of, of, of like contributions from each of their Voronoi cells. The Voronoi cells, if they both have area one, each have area of about 100. And so you could say that sum of squares of distances for, over the Voronoi cells is like an integral of area where equal areas correspond. So that motivated this, this definition that I'm, 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 I'm giving here. We are looking, and it's illustrated here for curves, but we're going to do it for surfaces, of course. So what we do is we look at an, an area preserving, I don't know, does this, does this uh, give a pointer? Yes. We look at an area preserving diffeomorphism from one to the other. And uh, we, uh, uh, we then look at, at, at the best possible uh, uh, rigid transformation from one to the other that brings the two in, in correspondence. And uh, that, for a, given, uh, for a given C, gives us this best possible correspondence. And then we'll find, try to find the best C that, achieve, that achieves the minimum of that distance, and we define that as a continuous procrustis distance. Now, the, the, uh, we, we have this area preserving here. Um, well, you have to talk about some class of, of, of things that you're going to compare. Area preserving is only going to be really uh, uh, relevant in case that the surfaces are fairly closely related. Because if they're not, then uh, uh, you can't really expect an area preserving uh, uh, consistency. So I'll have to come back to that. Um, OK, well, same thing if you, I, we showed it for curves, but we have this, this for the continuous procrustis distance between surfaces. And then you can put a texture on one of the surfaces and transport it to the other. and, and, and in order to see what the mapping is. So the big thing, the nice thing, well, I'll come back to that. But so what we have here is, as I promised you, a comparison of the distances we found, continuous procrustis distance, or the uh, conformal Wasserstein neighborhood distance, with observers. Uh, and you see the structure is more or less the same, and it's especially we, uh, we had uh, numbered the samples. We had a hundred and something samples. We had labeled them so that uh, things that had smaller distances were more likely to have labels next to each other. And so, especially the small distances, you see, are well preserved by, uh, uh, we very, very similar to what the observer distances were. And the continuous procrustis distance was a little better at it, you look here than the uh, conformal Wasserstein neighborhood distance. So it was, the, the, the CWN was harder to compute and, and not quite as good, so that, 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 uh, uh, that was essentially its death sentence. And by now we even have lost the code. We wanted to look at it again and, and, and uh, we don't have it anymore. Um, but what was especially interesting was that since we had mappings, we could indeed propagate landmarks, and it turns out that the landmarks propagated by our, our mappings were fairly close to the landmarks of, of, of uh, placed by the observer. Uh, something interesting happened, and so in this whole process, we've bypassed explicit landmarking, explicit feature extraction completely. Not that we might not want to return it at some point. I was very interested by the previous talk, and, and I, I took full notes, and we're going to look at the code. I mean, and, and, uh, uh, but this was, this was very interesting. Plus, uh, the continuous, I mean, the, 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 the neighborhood distance gave a kind of soft mapping, since it was a, in a, a Wasserstein uh, 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 framework, a Kantorovich framework. It, it, it didn't give a, a pointwise correspondence. But the continuous procrustis distance gave actually a pointwise mapping. Uh, uh, so this was of great interest to the biologists. And um, in fact, they, uh, uh, since we have a mapping between every pair of surfaces, uh, they started looking at some of these, these mappings in detail, and they turned out they, they were not very happy with some of the mappings for pairs that were 
kind of dissimilar. I mean, the, the mappings that came out were, and so on. And that caused, uh, 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 it took me a, a while to understand that. I mean, these interdisciplinary collaborations, there's a whole lot of sociology in there as well. I mean, it took me a while to understand this, but uh, uh, for a while, the collaboration didn't progress. I mean, when, when we were wanted to, uh, to, to say things, they said, yes, but, and Doug said, but uh, we should first correct that mapping. and and and. and what happened is that although we had uh, formulated the problem originally as finding a better way of computing distances, and we felt we had succeeded, and indeed we published, that we could do that with a much higher accuracy than they had uh, thought was possible. Once they saw that we defined mappings to get to those distances, the mappings actually were much more interesting to them than the distances themselves. One reason for that is that they are very interested in looking at uh, an a uh, asking and then answering and investigating evolutionary questions that work with part of the surface. And when you do it with landmarks, you can't really represent a part by just three landmarks. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't give you any statistical uh, relevance anymore. But if you have a mapping, then you can, of, of the surfaces, then you can now have a whole piece of the surface for which you have correspondences. And so they were very interested in using that. And so as soon as we produced mappings, it became, although they didn't articulate it, that the mappings became much more important to them than just distances. Yes, Herbert. By now it's fast, but uh, yes. How many points? No, no. How many points on the surface? So, I told you. I mean, I'm just a cheerleader. They do the hard work. Uh, <laughs> So you, you do collapse the mesh? Yes. The mesh is collapsed from the morphosaurus data, yes. Yes, and I think the morphosaurus data has about uh, 30,000 vertices or something. They vary, but they're much more. Yeah, they're incredibly fine. Um, but so, when, when, when I, I articulated, I said, look, you're, you guys are now much more interested in the maps then, and so on. That's when things uncongealed again, and uh, uh, we started uh, making progress again. So, so we want to, to, to build good maps. Um, and that's one of the goals. At the very end, I'll talk about future directions, and that will come up again. Okay, so uh, if you take the continuous procrustes distance for a data set that uh, Tengran Gao, uh, one of my former students who uh, is going to go to uh, Chicago in, in, uh, in the fall, uh, data set that he used that was uh, for uh, five different species of, of lemur, we had 10 individuals per species. And uh, if you did the continuous progressive distance on, on those, uh, this is the, uh, uh, and you do uh, multi-dimensional scaling, you reduce, you make the best three-dimensional projection. This is uh, the plot that you get. I, I have, I had a movie, but I forgot to put it on here, where you can, can uh, uh, see, but, but this gives you an impression already of, of how things are localized. Um, same color as same species. Um, but, uh, as I said, and as I repeated all the time to, to, to our biological collaborators, the, uh, the distances are really trustworthy only when they're small. Large distances we have much less trust in. I mean, in this matrix, 
things that had labels close to each other and so at small distance, we believed, things that had large distances. We don't expect the distance to be as, as, as trustworthy and we don't expect the maps to be as trustworthy. And so in fact, the maps that we had, I mean, they were unhappy with some of our maps, but the maps that we had uh, for small distances were all uh, very good maps. Uh, but we, we wanted to also make that, uh, uh, that, that geometry more, uh, that, that importance of small distances more clear to, uh, uh, to our collaborators. And one way of, of actually parlaying these small distances into better overall distances is to use uh, 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 diffusion distances. Um, I was on the wrong end here. Um, so my, my way of looking at, at that is that uh, if you have something that is really a manifold and you have points on that manifold, you, we have no idea of the real way of measuring distances on the manifold. But we assume the manifold is a reasonable manifold. And so if you, if you, if you think of, of, of when distances are small, if you have some way of measuring distances that you believe is probably close to Euclidean distance in, in the very large space in which the whole thing lives, then you, you have a, a, a reasonable, uh, you, you in a sense are, are, are making a, a, a planar approximation and you have a good uh, estimate for the, the, the projection of the distances on the tangent plane. So you have little, I, I, I think of it geometrically as having little doilies that I put on the, the surface and that, as doilies do, follow the surface and all these little doilies together will make together the manifold. And every little doily is essentially flat and so. So if I have all these, these small distances, then I can get an idea of what the surface looks like putting it together. So in a sense, uh, this diffusion, this idea of, 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 of knitting together the local geometry to get an idea of the whole thing is the analyst's way of, of trying to put together the uh, balls. I mean, as we saw in Herbert's talk, where he did the more topological thing. I mean, uh, of course, it's, it's, it, you do things in a different way. I mean, we, we're really using, we're going to use analysis to knit it together. And uh, instead of getting a, a, a more global picture immediately from the, 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 the ensemble of balls that you would get in, 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 uh, in uh, computational topology. Okay, so you look at, at these little neighborhoods where things are reliable, you have distances in those neighborhoods, but they make you jump from one to another. So that means that you now can have long paths that are more reliable on your manifold, essentially. Uh, how do you do that in practice? Um, well, you have your graph, you have distances between points in the graph that you believe in more. You also have distances that you believe in less. But what we're going to do is we're going to build a random walk on that graph where the probability of doing a step decreases uh, like a Gaussian in a Gaussian way with the distance. So uh, we, we're not completely discounting those long distances, but it's much more probable that you're going at small distances. And so if you want to go a far distance, then you have to take several small hops highly likely to get there. So you build a, uh, a matrix, and uh, I, I know many people call it still the Laplacian, but the physicist in me cringes when, 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 when I hear that. So you write a matrix in which the entries are the dij squared over uh, uh, two epsilon, and you normalize appropriately. And uh, because your points don't have all the same degree, you have to put in an extra weight in order to, to really talk about uh, an, a discrete approximation of what I would call a diffusion operator. So it's, it's not a Laplacian, it's really a diffusion because you have e to the minus, I mean, you have this local behavior. 
the you then once you have your diffusion operator uh, uh, you you so you you look at this with an extremely small time t over n and you take the nth power of this so that you really are talking about uh, tiny, t tiny, tiny steps glued together in order to get geometry. But I still have t here as a parameter. So this represents now a discrete approximation of e to the, the, the minus, uh, yeah, and as a physicist, I would write this as minus Laplacian. Uh, 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 and uh, times t, uh, the ijth element of this operator. That's essentially what you have. So you have a, a, a semi-group of operators. And t here indicates how far you're diffusing. So you have still a parameter that, that, that you control. So then you look at that operator, and you, you find its eigenvectors. Those are then the, uh, uh, the vectors that, that, that uh, uh, we also saw. I mean, in, in the, we, we're having the same operator, which is the, the, the uh, Swiss army knife of, of, of uh, spectral study of, 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 of manifolds. And uh, we, uh, we use that then to uh, uh, represent a shape as a, uh, by looking at, at uh, every, uh, every point on the shape uh, can be characterized by the values taken uh, by the eigenfunctions in that point. And uh, so you have, a, 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 you, you, you truncate after a certain number of eigenvectors, and so you have a parameterization in a high dimensional space of the original shape, but in which you believe that taking Euclidean distances there, uh, uh, tempered with the, uh, uh, the eigenvalues of the uh, uh, diffusion operator, give you a better approximation of some kind of geodesic distance. So these are called diffusion distances. And in that definition with your Gaussian operator that you apply, a critical element is the choice of t. Because t is going to define the scale. Absolutely. Absolutely. Scale. Absolutely. And in, in practice, what happens is that Depending on 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 your uh, on on the uh, representation of the surface you have and how discretized it is and so on, you typically play with t play in order t. to yes. Because in fact t, if this is a Gaussian operator, by increasing t, you're going yes. to capture the local geometry. Exactly. You're going to build a, a, a local representation of the uh, surface at each point. Well. Uh, you, you, you try to, to build things, uh, to, to get things locally connected by using uh, uh, n here. I mean, you really do want to use a sufficiently large n in that computation in order to get things uh, connected. But you still play with t, but not over an enormous range. But you still play with t in order to get... Uh, to get uh, n tells you how far you go. Yes. t gives you the local scale. You have yes, to exactly. To yes. But n, if the number of We, but we, 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 uh, we do reduce, uh, the, the, yeah, we collapse the, 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 I mean, the geometry we have for these teeth, although they who do have lots of protuberances and so on, doesn't really require 30,000 points to characterize, so. Okay, so that gives you a diffusion distance, and in the diffusion distance, so we, we used the continuous progressive distance, but now we only we gave much more emphasis to local distances than to, to, to uh, larger distances in order to compute from it this diffusion distance. And what you find is that it already gives you a much better clustering of the species than the continuous progressive distance did. So uh, uh, now the, the, is that? You can actually do much better, and that's the next thing I want to say. But let me now talk a little bit about the maps. So um, 
this uh, this result did uh, convince uh, to some extent uh, our collaborators that the uh, that the, the the small distances did indeed give us a lot of information and more reliable information than the long distances and quantified all that. They said, okay, so if we have uh, 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 mappings between uh, uh, these different surfaces, then we should be using uh, the small hops rather than the big hop to find a correspondence between this surface and that surface. Okay, but uh, the interesting thing is that uh, if you look at the maps that we produce, then of course they uh, give you, uh, they're not consistent in the sense that if you go by two different routes from one surface to another one, you don't end up with the same result. You say, well, of course. But, well, no, not of course, because if the true maps, if we really had the true maps, the biologists uh, argue, then uh, if you had uh, samples A, B, C, and A and B had a common ancestor uh, D, and which was also an ancestor of C, then the mapping from A to B should be the same as going from A to D and D to B, because they both inherited their stuff from D. Same for C. So what that really means, I mean, you immediately see, is that if that the mapping from A to C should consist, be consistent with going over B to C. I mean, since they all really are inherited from D. So it should be consistent. There should not be uh, this, this inconsistency. It should really be uh, a, a flat connection. I mean, uh, so uh, our maps are not. I mean, so you can then wonder about uh, what should you take. And Jesus actually uh, 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 worked in his thesis on uh, alignments of shapes and so on, in which he used the minimum spanning tree. That restores uniqueness. I mean, and since you trust small distances better, okay, minimum spanning tree. However, the minimum spanning tree is, as everybody knows, not very robust, meaning if you, you could have a new element added to the, and the whole tree could change. I mean, or things are a bit noisy, and uh, if you move a little bit, your noise, again, the tree could change, and so this mapping could change. So that was not very satisfactory. And Rob Revere is actually working on using the mappings and uh, putting, uh, 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 looking at, at many possible paths to go from one place to the other and look at probability and distributions over those in order to make all that much more robust. I mean, the result is then also that you, you then, in a robust way, don't define the point-to-point -point correspondence between landmarks anymore. You get a certain spread. But uh, so we're, we're, that's one avenue in which we're working. Okay, but let me show you now uh, uh, how, in fact, you can do much better yet than the diffusion distance. And uh, this is a result of the thesis of Ting Ran Gao. Uh, he gets to this horizontal uh, diffusion distance, which comes from interpreting uh, uh, the whole setup slightly differently. So to get the diffusion distances, we use the local distances that we had gotten from these continuous procrustes maps. And we knit it together and we got the spectral parameterization and so on. But we had, in fact, uh, much more information at the beginning. I mean, in order to do the diffusion distance, we were using the mappings only to get that numerical value of the distance. And we forgot everything else about the mapping. But the mapping gives it a beautiful structure on the, 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 on, on the whole, the whole uh, uh, setup. We have a fiber bundle. So if we think of the collection of all teeth, of all possible teeth as a manifold, which is reasonable if you think of fairly closely related species and many individuals per species and so on, then 
for each, each element on the manifold of teeth is really a tooth. And what we have is we have mappings between all these teeth. So we have a, a, a connection. So we have a fiber bundle, meaning a base manifold where each thing represents a manifold on its, in its own right. And we have that connection, uh, a family of mapping between the individual fibers. And uh, uh, you can then use these to define a much more detailed diffusion structure. And on this much higher dimensional project and project onto the base manifold at a much later stage. What that essentially does is it exploits this geometry, this fiber and so on, to remove more noise. I mean, because everything is extremely noisy, of course. And so how does he do that? Well, I mean, mathematically speaking, you have a base manifold, you have the fiber manifold consists of uh, something that you, uh, 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 you, can, you can project the total manifold to the, 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 uh, uh, the base everywhere. And a uh, typical example of that is the cylinder or a Möbius band. And uh, the, the Möbius band illustrates that you can have a geometry that's more complex than uh, just what you would get from putting parallel fibers next to each other. They can connect in a non-trivial non, non way. Um, so the diffusion that we were uh, thinking of on the base manifold is something that we can that we implement uh, that we can think of as uh, coming from this connection uh, uh, on, on, on the fibers. And we will eventually want to project that connection down on the base manifold. So uh, instead of, of taking diffusion maps, as we were looking earlier with the exponential that I raised, I'm sorry, and uh, looking at eigenvectors there, uh, what, you, what we do is we, uh, we look at something where we keep the same uh, element on the ijth column, but each ijth element now, instead of a number that's given by e to the minus d ij squared over epsilon, gets multiplied by a matrix, a little matrix, that talks about how you go from uh, uh, surface i to surface j. And how do we get that matrix? Well. We have triangles on one manifold, on one surface that go to the other surface. If we had exact correspondence of our, our, our uh, vertices, then of course it would just be a permutation matrix. But uh, uh, we don't. I mean, things actually end up in the middle of triangles. And so things spread out a little bit over triangles. And that means that you can actually uh, uh, there also at the level of the, the surface, uh, you can think of diffusing a little bit more or a little bit less by uh, taking powers. And so that's what, uh, what, 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 uh, what is done in this, in, this, uh, in this setup. And so you now have a much larger uh, uh, situation where before each of these things was just one, 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 uh, uh, one point I mean, we now have a, a whole, whole, uh, 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 a whole, yeah. So, did I have it here? Sorry. No, I don't. Okay. So, what instead of of uh, having a situation where we uh, looked, where where for surface i, surface j, we had these distances d i j, and we parlayed them into one big matrix for which we then had eigenvectors uh, u k that had uh, entries at a different j. And so we could uh, use that to parameterize, to give a high dimensional parameterization of the surfaces. We'll now have a parameterization in which we have the surface as well as the points on the surfaces that play a role. And 
so with each color standing for a surface, we have eigenvectors that are now much longer in structure. And uh, you can then look at those uh, uh, at, at eigenvectors and, and, and look at, at these collections. And you see here the difference between the two situations. So, oh yeah, okay. So we have these eigenvectors and we can go for a certain number uh, uh, indexed by both the surfaces and the points. And we can then project to the geometry on the base manifold by uh, looking at a, uh, a distance that depends on epsilon and delta, choices of epsilon and delta that you made, by looking at the, par the characterization and summing over all the points P and Q. And uh, this, uh, the, the dependence on, on delta here actually means that points at P and Q that are far apart will actually contribute very little to that distance. And uh, so what you get is you improve the, uh, uh, the species uh, 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 separation from this diffusion distance, which was already much better than the uh, 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 continuous procrustes distance to this situation. And uh, when, when uh, Doug Boyer saw this, this result, uh, he was struck by the fact that uh, the species were regrouped in, 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 in uh, the groupings that we see here, two of them, two of them, and a separate one, because in fact, two of them were frugivores, two of them were leaf eaters, and one was insectivore. And it really split them nicely. And so it's, again, not unlikely that looking at the geometry of the manifold of molars, you would find that it's related to the function of... of uh. So, um, You can use this also because now what we did is we, we have represented each of these surfaces in, uh, in, in this high dimensional space that comes from the eigenvectors of the diffusion of the connection, uh, uh, the diffusion on, on, on the, the total fiber bundle. So you can actually use that to register the surfaces together and that actually works very well. So basically, you have uh, uh, one point, you can then find the closest point on the uh, other representation of an, a different surface, so you can register different uh, uh, things. So you have an improved mapping. Um, you can also try to do a spectral clustering. So in this high dimensional space, you can where all your different surfaces are represented, you can say, well, what would happen if I tried to find 10 clusters, 12 clusters? Let me find 12 clusters and color the points accordingly, and then look at what I get on my data set. And this is what you get. And uh, so Tingran had done this as a kind of, of, of experiment to get a, a visualization for what was happening. And uh, our, our biological collaborators went absolutely, well, I wouldn't say ballistic, but they were ecstatic. I mean, uh, because as they looked at this, they said, oh, and I forget, of course, the exact terms because I know nothing about teeth. Uh, still to this day, I don't. Actually, Tingran picked up quite a lot of the vocabulary, but he couldn't be here. Uh, but but they, because you see some of these, 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 these fields, so here you have this small green, and it's much larger there. And uh, I mean, so, but whatever I thought might have been inconsistencies was biologically meaningful to them. So they said, oh, look, I mean, it's small here, it's large there, and this, and this. I mean, they believed everything they saw. Yes, Manuel. This is outside of the right? Yes. And uh, so they, uh, as a result, they actually uh, are already using this. And I was saying, hold your horses, we're going to do more. No, 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 they wanted to use it. Already using this in order to uh, look at evolutionary questions on part of teeth. I mean, uh, uh, because they, they believe this segmentation, they really like the way we obtained it, and, and uh, so, uh, uh, so they're already running with this. Um, okay, so I've told you about, about uh, 
the collaboration and the, the, some of the sociology of the collaboration and, and, and where we're going and what we're doing. Let me tell you about uh, uh, ongoing and future directions. So as I told you, the true connection should be flat for these biological regions. Uh, uh, should we, how can we incorporate this? I mean, for the moment, if we have a full collection uh, and we, we do the parameterization, I mean, uh, if we do the global registration, that gives us indeed a, 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 a flat connection. But if we get new samples added to it, should we have to redo the whole thing? I mean, how will things work out? Can we, how should we incorporate that best? We know that the minimum spanning tree is not a good idea. And as I told you, Rob is working on, on, on approaches to, to uh, to guarantee that we have this, this nice uh, uh, flatness in, in as a, uh, an essential ingredient. Um, so another thing that I've been uh, 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 hoping we could do at some point, and I've been very interested in, in, learning, in hearing the talks about learning on, 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 on surfaces for that, that uh, reason, is that uh, if we take collections that they have landmarked, that our biologist friends have landmarked for us, then uh, a work of, 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 of Yaron's group uh, gives way of building beautiful, consistent mappings for these landmark teeth. I mean, where the landmarks correspond exactly. Actually, I thought that uh, these, these uh, uh, consistent mappings that are constructed by minimizing, optimizing some geometric constraints would not be satisfactory to the biologist because, well, why would these geometric constraints have to do something with teeth? In there? And so I thought that we would then have them look at this and say, oh, this point is not right, and so, and would give us extra constraints, so give noon landmarks, so that we could then incorporate them and get good mappings. But it turns out they love the mappings. They think they're perfect, I mean. So, and it, maybe it should be not have been as surprising to me because what it really means is that the landmarks, the collection of landmarks, they choose and they know with their domain knowledge, although they can't articulate why, are truly representative of the surface, are enough to characterize these surfaces and so on. So maybe with the landmarks and geometric constraint, it is not so surprising that you can actually build the mappings. But in any case, the idea is if the landmark cases they give us, uh, we can build mappings with. So that gives us a database of good mappings. Maybe we can learn from these good mappings how to build good mappings without the landmarks. I mean, so that would be another way of getting uh, uh, to, to mappings. And uh, so, uh, Lately, we've even thought maybe we can learn how to landmark. So let me, I mean, Shahar may be uh, saying some more about that or, or not, but in any case, let me leave it at that. Something that I very, very much would like to do is to do, uh, and that is beyond what we're doing right now, is to have a kind of multi-resolution or a hierarchical way of looking, coarse and fine-graining. Because for the moment we're looking at teeth of lemurs and related primates. These are fairly, uh, fairly uh, uh, similar. I mean, they look very different and so on. But there are mammals that look quite, uh, look, look, look much more different than that. I mean, this is one of the most extreme. These are the molars of crab eater seals. I mean, it's clear that there's not going to be good correspondence maps between those and those little molars of primates. I mean, what I expect may be the case, and this is uh, also uh, bolstered by uh, uh, theories about teeth evolution and teeth growth, tooth growth, is, is uh, that there may be, if we go to a coarser representation of the teeth, still a correspondence, but that then, uh, uh, finer structures that have evolved on the teeth do not correspond. So I'd very much like something in which we look at these surfaces as things that have representations at different scales. 
and where the, the, the biological distance in, in ancestry uh, governs at what scale you really should look at the correspondence maps and where you should not do that. So, but for the moment, that's just science fiction. I mean, uh, it's, 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 uh, I don't even have a good framework to, to describe that. But I should stop here. Thank you. Well, it's not the same object. I mean, it's, 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 if you think of the second molar of a lemur as a, an abstraction, then you could view many lemurs having different realizations of that object, I guess. But, uh, but I really have all these different teeth. So uh, those differences are reflected uh, as inside this uh, one fiber, or otherwise just in the neighborhood? In the neighborhood. So a fiber. Uh, so I, I drew it one-dimensional, but it's really a two-dimensional surface. The tooth itself is the fiber. I mean, so, so the, 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 the base manifold is the, uh, the individual animals, and uh, uh, the, the tooth, uh, every, every, uh, for every animal, we have a two-dimensional surface, and we have correspondences between those surfaces, and we also have it uh, for different species. And in fact, I expect that these things will slightly overlap. I mean, the most extreme of one species will be uh, not so far from the most extreme in another direction of another species. And, uh, uh, but each of them is a two-dimensional surface. So. But inside this fiber, uh, I understand because it will be rotated, it, uh, you use the action of the clinging group. Oh, uh, we, we, we model that out. I mean, we, we, uh, uh, the fiber is already uh, the, the, the surface uh, up to rigid transformations. So rigid transformation doesn't uh, go vertically inside the fiber? No. So could you tell us well, what's inside this fiber? The, 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 the surface itself. I mean, the different points on the surface is a two-dimensional fiber. So, so moving on the surface will move you um, um, I mean, scrubbing the teeth, will, will the bristles will move on, on the fiber. Oh, so actually this fiber is uh, the shape itself? Yes. Okay. Just a quick question. Oh, Herbert had a question too. Herbert. Herbert, please. Oh. So going back to your first construction. Yes. It seemed like above the wall idea would be to mix in uh, curvature. Yes, absolutely, because we were using only intrinsic things and we should also use extrinsic, absolutely. And, and that's something... But to what extent does your methods do that? Or does it do something else also? In, in, uh, we, we do have, in the continuous progressive distance, uh, some extrinsic things uh, uh, seem, to be, seem to be sitting in there. But we are thinking of, of, of actually defining local feature vectors. I mean, in this idea of learning mapping, uh, learning how to, 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 to landmark or learning mapping, we are thinking of, 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 of uh, still flattening because it makes it easier to search, but looking at, at, at a feature, at, at a, a vector, I mean the conformal factor, the, 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 uh, the mean curvature and, and possibly other. Uh, yeah. My small question. We, we should still give credit to the uh, morphometrist that oh. is looking for landmarks. But there's one thing that uh, morphometrists will do intuitively that uh, I'm yet wondering how we can capture that when we do this type of measure. If you give a morphometrist two teeth mm -hmm. that are partial, mm 
the not complete team, yes. when they will pick their landmarks, they'll know which one to ignore and yeah. only keep the one that they expect to match. Yeah, it's, 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 so this whole aspect of finding partial matching. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, they, these landmarks that they put in really uh, uh, capture an enormous amount of domain knowledge. And also, it's, I mean, we have these teeth with exquisite detail. I mean, when, the land, when, when cusps are really protuberant, it's clear that they're landmarks. But then if you have a whole collection and uh, some of the, 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 the cusps become less prominent in, in, in some of the, the species, there are other little cusps. I mean, and which one to pick? We have no clue. I mean, uh, but, but they, they do. They do. And they're, they're actually not completely consistent, but fairly consistent uh, from, one, from one expert to another. So, uh, so there is a lot of domain knowledge. And like, as always, it's domain knowledge that they, they, they have absorbed it by osmosis and, 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 uh, and they can't really articulate it. And that's one of the things, that's one reason why we want to, to learn good maps. I mean, uh, one problem we have with, with trying to apply deep learning is that our data sets are not very large. I mean, if you have 100 teeth, I mean, to get 10 individuals of, 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 of a species is already more. I mean, uh, so it's really because they believe in the collaboration that they actually will spend the time landmarking. And, uh, but, uh, 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 but we'll never get the, the, the hundreds or, or thousands that you. So one thing that we're also thinking of is, is how to, uh, uh, to, to use the examples we have to populate our manifold much better. So uh, we, you, you, you need a kind of generative way of doing it and then some, 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 some actor uh, to, to remove stuff that's not good. Well, we have the biologists to remove the stuff yes. that's not good. <laughs> So let's thank Ingrid again.